Amigos. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Here, monks, a monk makes a declaration of final knowledge thus. I understand birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. That monk's words should not be approved or disapproved. Without approving or disapproving, a question should be put thus, friend, there are four kinds of expression rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. What for? Telling the seen as it is seen, telling the heard as it is heard, telling the sensed as it is sensed telling the cognized as it is cognized. These, friend, are the four kinds of expression rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees accomplished and fully awakened. How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these four kinds of expression so that through not craving and clinging, his mind is liberated from the taints. When a monk is one with taints destroyed, who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. This is the nature of his answer. Regarding the scene, I abide unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. Regarding the herd, I abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. Regarding the sensed, I abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with the mind rid of barriers. Regarding the cognized, I abide unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with the mind rid of barriers. It is by knowing and seeing thus, and regarding these four kinds of expression, that through not craving and clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. Saying good, one may, de one may delight and rejoice in that monk's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. Friend, there are these five aggregates affected by craving and clinging. Now, one of the things that I want you to realize is the five aggregates are not always affected by craving and clinging. They may be affected by craving and clinging. That is, if there is still uh, some craving left in the person's awareness. But it's not always. What five? They are material form aggregate. Now this is talking about being affected by craving and clinging, and if you're trying to find out if a person is an arahat or not, you talk to them about that. And you find out what their observations are with each one of these different aggregates. 
the feeling aggregate affected by craving and clinging, the perception aggregate affected by craving and clinging, the formation aggregate affected by craving and clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by craving and clinging. These, friend, are the five aggregates which may or may not be affected by craving and clinging. Rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. How does a Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these five aggregates which may be affected by craving and clinging? So that through not craving and clinging, his mind is liberated from the taints. Monks, when a monk is one with taints destroyed and is completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the nature of his answer. Friend, having known material form to be feeble, fading away and comfortless, with a destruction, fading away and cessation, giving up and relinquishing of attraction and clinging, craving and clinging regarding material form of material, uh, mental uh, standpoints, adherences and underlying tendencies regarding material form. I understand that my mind is liberated. Friend, having known feeling, having known perception, having known formations, having known consciousness to be feeble, fading away and comfortless. Now we're talking about Anicca at this point. How everything is in a state of change. It's, it's not permanent. With the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of attraction and craving and clinging towards one of these aggregates of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding consciousness and the other aggregates, I have understood that my mind is liberated. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, regarding these five aggregates, which may or may not be affected by craving and clinging, that through not craving and clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. Saying good, one might delight and rejoice in that monk's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. Friend, there are these six elements rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. What six? They are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. These, friend, are the six elements rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. <coughs> How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these six elements? So that through not craving and clinging, his mind is liberated from the taints. Monks, when a monk is one whose taints are destroyed, and is completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the nature of his answer. Friends, I have treated the earth element as not self, with no self based on the earth element. This is the impersonal nature of everything. And this is something that's very confusing for an awful lot of people, and I don't really understand why. Because of the false belief in a personal self that is associated with craving, people get confused and they say, well, if this is not myself, then where is myself? 
There is no self. There is only the observation. Now this is why it's so important to understand the six R's. Recognizing that your mind is distracted while you're sitting. Releasing the distraction. Now this is really important and an awful lot of people get confused by this. Don't keep your attention on what is distracting your attention. Let it be there by itself. Don't feed it with your attention. And when you do that, and then you relax the tightness caused by that misconception when it arises, then you're very clear. You don't have distracting thoughts. You don't have thoughts at all. You're just able to observe clearly without any craving in your mind. You're, you're observing with a pure mind. The whatever it is that um, is is arising. Now you need to bring up something wholesome. That's what smiling is about. The more you smile, the lighter your mind becomes, the clearer your mind becomes the sharper your mindfulness becomes. And this is extremely important. Now you bring that pure, clean mind that's uplifted a little to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation. So the six R's are another way of describing the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Keep following with the six R's. Keep relaxing, letting go of that false belief in the personal self. Now, why do you have distractions come up? Because in the past you broke a precept. Now, I know talking about precepts and, and morality is not very popular in America or in the West because it's been pushed very strongly by the, the uh, Catholic religion about having a guilty feeling and needing to go through somebody else to get rid of that guilty feeling. But the, honestly, what's most important is for you to realize that the whole reason you're here is because of breaking precepts. When you break a precept, you feel guilty. When you feel guilty, you take it on personally and you start saying, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. And when you do that, you have the false belief in a personal self. And the only way to let go of that false belief in a personal self is by using the six R's. And I say it's the only way I really mean that. You have to be able to relax and let go of the craving. That's the most important part of the six R's because that is the second noble truth. And letting go of that is the third noble truth. So, please understand that any time you have 
an identification with the thoughts, with the feelings, with sensations when they come up. When you take them personally, you are feeding that false belief in a personal self. So when you let go of that, when you relax and let it be, then your mind becomes clear. This is the main difference in what most people are teaching in meditation. Because an awful lot of people that do different kinds of meditation, they don't recognize the the hindrances when they come up. They have an idea that hindrances, they stop you from meditating. You're supposed to really stop it, push it away, suppress it, make it so it doesn't come up anymore. But as I said last week, I have a friend that's been teaching for 50 years, and from the very beginning of his practice, he has had fear. And you can still hear fear in his body in his voice when he's talking that says something about not being able to recognize hindrances when they come up, taking the hindrances personally, trying to stop and try to, try to push them down, try to not bother you. But the truth is there is tightness in your head, in your mind, and you need to have the six R's so that you can let these go. Now it doesn't matter when you are, whether you are sitting in meditation or you're having your daily activities. Anytime a hindrance arises, the truth is it's there. Anytime you try to push it away, anytime you try to stop it, you are causing yourself more and more suffering. You cause your own suffering. You can't blame somebody else for uh, something that they said or did. You can't blame them for the cause of your suffering. You are the cause of your own suffering. And the more you stop getting involved with it, the more you start relaxing into it, the clearer your mind becomes, the happier you become. And you're going to learn by stages going through this. Now, when you are doing your practice, and you are letting go of that craving, you see more and more clearly how you cause your own suffering. The way things are going in the world today is to look for blame in anybody else but yourself. And the truth is, nobody else can, by doing what they say or doing uh, unwholesome things, that is not the cause of your suffering. Your suffering is caused by yourself. The importance of keeping the six R's can never be overstated. It can't be stated enough. You need to be, be able to practice this all the time. And keeping your precepts without breaking them is exceptionally important. Anytime you break a precept, you have a guilty feeling. Now that's going to come up while you're trying to calm your mind down. It's going to make your mind very active. And you need to let that go. 
You need to be able to use the six R's so that they will not, uh, the, the hindrance will go away by itself. As soon as you let go of that tight mind, as soon as you relax, Quite often people will tell me, well, I can't do that because I'm busy. I have to work. I have to do this. I have to do that. This takes a fraction of a second when you get good at keeping your precepts. So don't make excuses for breaking your precepts. Don't make excuses for not letting go of the hindrance. Just do it. Again, it doesn't take very long. And the more you can recognize when that tension and tightness is in your head, in your mind, and you let it go, the more uplifted your mind becomes. The happier you become. Now, when I'm teaching a retreat, quite often I tell people to turn their thoughts and feelings into a game. Play with it. Don't get over serious. One of the biggest problems that people have when they are uh, practicing meditation is getting over serious and then start criticizing yourself because you made a mistake. Instead of laughing with yourself because your mind's going crazy, you would rather get serious with yourself and beat yourself up and cause yourself an immeasurable amount of pain. Well, that's you doing that to yourself. If you play with it, if you laugh with yourself because your mind goes crazy, and it does that sometimes, then you will become more and more clear. And you're going to keep your precepts more and more without breaking them. When you do that, your mind naturally becomes more tranquil. Quite often, during the start of a retreat, almost everybody has a bad day or two to start with. Well, why? Because you didn't keep your precepts as well as you could. You have a lot of disturbance in your mind. Your mind is still active like it is when you're out doing this and that. And then when you come in to start sitting at the retreat, it takes a day or two to settle down. Once it starts settling down, now you're starting to teach yourself more and more. And the thing with meditation that you really do need to understand deeply is you are your own teacher. You know where your soft spots are. You know where you make mistakes. The trick is to be kind to yourself, to be gentle with yourself, not to be critical with yourself. Using the six R's teaches you that. And it's not a maybe. It really does work this way. A lot of people start complaining to me about this is too simple. It can't be this easy. It's got to be more complicated than this. And it's not. <clears throat> this is the way it actually works. The trick is that you have to remind yourself over and over and over again until you start putting into practice the six R's and it becomes more automatic. 
And this leads to an uplifted mind. This leads to more happiness for you that you can give away. You can give this happiness away to everybody else around you. Have you ever walked into a room where somebody's depressed and you feel like turning around and walking out because they're so depressed? Well, they're giving you a negative. You want to help change their mind? You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to try to convince them of anything. What you have to do is start sending loving and kind thoughts to that person that's depressed. This is called compassion, isn't it? And the more you practice it, the better you get at it. Until you walk into a room and people just automatically, they start smiling a little bit. And they're happy to see you. And the talk that you have with them is more uplifted, more kind, more gentle. That's the whole point of doing the meditation. Do this enough, use the six R's enough, and it will start to be automatic over a period of time. And the more automatic it becomes, the more enjoyable life becomes. So it's a real important thing for you to understand So I'm going to get back to the sutta and find out more about the questions you need to ask someone that says, I am an arahat. I know there are some people that they claim they're arahats and they actually are not because they're not able to answer these kind of questions. This particular sutta is very important to understand. So you can discern whether you think somebody is an arahat or not. You can tell for yourself. Are there arahats in the world? I'm not sure. Maybe. But whether they are an arahat or not doesn't really matter. It's what I'm doing with myself. It's the clarity of mind that I have and the understanding that I have that's most important. Okay. Friends, I have treated the earth element as not self, with no self based on the earth element. And with the destruction fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of attraction, and the craving and clinging based on the earth element of mental standpoints, adherences, underlying tendencies based on the earth element. I have understood that my mind is liberated. Now, how do you have that kind of thing automatically arise? When you have done enough work with the six R's, you will get into a state that is pure intuition, intuitive mind. Intuitive mind is always correct. It's always right. And there's no um, trying to come up with answers. The answers will come up by themselves automatically, quickly. Friends, I have treated the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element as not self. But where is the self? There is no self. There is only process. 
everything is part of a process. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. In the six sets of six that's drummed into you, over and over, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. When you start to um, do what I did for, I did it for about six months. I spent, every time I had a thought arise, I started questioning, is this me? Is this my thought? Did I ask this thought to come up? Did I ask this feeling to come up? Did I ask this process to begin? And the answer was always, no, it's not me. It's not mine. I might pick up some thoughts from other people. Is that mine? No. It's just thoughts. You don't make them personal. After I did that for about six months, I had a deep realization that all of the stuff that arises doesn't matter what I was doing at the time, everything that arose, it wasn't me, it wasn't mine. There's no controlling. There's no trying to force your mind to be something that you think it should be. There is only realization that this is part of a process, and that process is called dependent origination, and that's how it works. So the more you start realizing that these crazy thoughts that arise, this extreme liking and disliking, and wanting and not wanting, and all of these things that come up, they're not yours. You don't take them personally. When you don't take them personally, you see the, the true nature of them which is just an arising and passing away of phenomena. But we've had so many lifetimes that we've taken things personally, and this is me, and this is mine, and this is who I am, and I like this, and I don't like that, and I'm angry, and I'm happy, and all of these different things that arise, and we take it all so personally that we completely lose sight of the way things actually are. And we'll fight for them. We'll fight to say, oh, this is me. And I'm right to be upset about this or that because they said this and they did that. And it's not helpful to your own happiness, to your own balance of mind. The whole thing with using the six R's is the equanimity that you are able to have in your mind without getting upset because it didn't happen the way I wanted it to or you didn't do what I asked you to do you start to have more balance. You're more at ease. And you naturally develop a kind of happiness that stays with you. So the emotional upsets, now that's part of uh, bhava in Pali, and I call it habitual tendencies. And the habitual tendency is always when we get caught in trying to think a feeling. Okay, you can't think your feelings because feelings are one thing and thoughts are something else. But you get caught in trying to control your feelings with your thoughts 
And the more you do that, the more pain you cause yourself, the more upset you become with yourself, the more you beat yourself up. And that's unwholesome. That's being caught in the unwholesome. Not just a little bit, but a lot. And that's the reason that you get depressed. That's the reason you get angry. You get afraid. You have anxiety. Worry. All of these different things arise because we don't use the six R's. We don't recognize this as part of an impersonal process. We start recognizing it as this is my process, this is me, this is who I am. And you don't develop your kindness to yourself. You get caught up in emotional upsets and cause yourself a lot of pain. So it's real important to understand how this process works and see the process in while it's working. And that's what the six R's do. It helps you to be more clear and truly understand how this process works. The more you understand this deeply, the more you get close to becoming an Arahat. Right? Don't get caught up in your likes and dislikes. They're not so important. And it's easy to forget. That's why you need to keep practicing using the six R's. That's why you need to start practicing smiling more and more. This is an all the time practice. <coughs> Excuse me. And the more you remember, the more uplifted your mind becomes. The easier it is to get a, a be with other people that might be completely disagreeable, but you don't have to disagree with them. You don't have to argue with them. You don't have to fight with them. You just allow them to have their own personal view. Now, I've been with some people that were very staunch Tibetan monks, very staunch Mahayana monks, and we can sit down and discuss what the Buddha is talking about without getting angry with each other, without disagreeing with each other, just accepting what the other person says and see if that works for you or it doesn't. You don't have to argue with them and try to convince them that they're wrong and you're right. That's why the politics of the day is let's fight with each other. I'm right, you're wrong. Well, that's nonsense stuff. That's just getting caught up in your habitual tendencies of trying to convince other people that you know the right way to do things and they don't. Most times that gets other people angry at you. Now you're fighting with them. Now you're, you're taking it all personally and you're causing yourself suffering. Developing your sense of humor to be able to laugh with people and have fun with people is the way to uplifted mind, to happy mind. 
who says that you're right and somebody else is wrong? That's just an opinion. It's not for real. It can be right, it can be wrong. So what? But as you start to let go of your attachment and your craving of I'm always right and you're always wrong, There is uh, some friends that I have in Indonesia. When I first started teaching them, they'd just gotten married. And the man's uh, father got a hold of the guy that was getting married. And right before he got married, he said, do you want a successful wedding or uh, a successful marriage and of course he said yes and he said then don't fight she's always right let her be right and play and then come up with solutions without fighting about it they've been married 10 years they haven't had a fight yet they don't get angry with each other. They wind up laughing with each other about, well, she's right, even though she's not. But then you can start discussing instead of holding a position where I'm right and you're wrong and we're going to have this disagreement. Now, who's attached at that time? Who is causing themselves suffering because of a personal opinion about it ought to be this way, not that way? You see what I'm trying to say? The more we can agree to disagree, but not fight about it, the easier it is to come up with a solution that's agreeable to everyone. So, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, relaxing, and relinquishing of attraction, and the craving and clinging based on that element, Letting go of the mental standpoints of this is the way it's got to be. Adherences, underlying tendencies based on one of these elements. I've understood that my mind is liberated. So there's no disagreement in yourself when you become an arahat. There's no beating yourself up. There's no hanging on to a particular belief. This is one of the beauties of uh, Buddhism that I've found is it's mental development. It's not religion. It's not, you got to do it this way because it says in this book or that book that that's the way it ought to be. There's none of that. There is only dealing with yourself and relaxing into it and not causing yourself undue suffering. It is by knowing thus and seeing thus regarding these six elements that through not craving and clinging my mind is liberated from the taints. Think about the relief that you would cause for yourself when you don't have any craving and clinging arising. The relief that you have. It's truly remarkable. Saying good, one might delight and rejoice in that monk's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. But friend, 
There are these six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. What six? They are the eye and forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and flavors, the body and tangibles, and mind and mind objects. These, friend, are the six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these six internal and external bases so that through not craving and clinging his mind is liberated from the taints? When a monk is one with taints destroyed and is accomplished, completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the nature of his answer. Friend, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, relinqu and relinquishing of desire, lust, and delight, craving, attraction, and clinging, of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding the eye and forms, I, and eye consciousness and things cognizable by mind through the eye consciousness. I have understood that my mind is liberated. Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? How much do you get attached to what you see or hear? And you want more of that or less of that. When you actually see the way things are, there is no attachment to it. There's no craving that arises until there is the thinking about. Once we get caught in thinking about, guess who has a hindrance in their, in their mind? Guess who causes themselves suffering? That doesn't happen for an arahat. He sees and understands these six sense doors as they actually are. And there's nothing to be attached to. There's nothing to hold on to. That's why the six R's are so important. You hear me pushing that a lot. Why? Because you need to hear it over and over and over again until you hear it so much, you actually start to understand it. Without true understanding, that means the direct experience of seeing how useful the six R's are and you start using them all the time. Then you're just going to understand by surface knowledge. With the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of desire, lust and delight, craving, attraction, craving and clinging, and of mental standpoints, adherences and underlying tendencies in regard to the ear and sounds and ear consciousness and things cognizable by the mind through the air consciousness. Regarding the nose and odors, nose consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through the nose consciousness. Regarding the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness, and things cognizable by mind through the tongue consciousness. Regarding the body, tangibles, body consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind, by the mind through body consciousness. Regarding mind, mind objects, mind consciousness, and things cognizable by mind through mind consciousness. I have understood that my mind is liberated. 
That means understanding that each one of these sense doors is not you, it's not yours. It is just part of a phenomena that arises. It is by knowing, thus seeing, thus regarding these six internal and external bases that through not craving and clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. What a heavy weight we carry around with us all the time because we identify so strongly with one of the sense doors with our own understanding, with our own wrong ideas of how these things actually occur. But friend, how does a venerable one know and see? How does uh, how, so that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, eye-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to conceit have been eradicated in him. How do you eradicate these things? It's simple. Use the six R's. Recognize when your mind is distracted. Let that distraction be there by itself. Don't feed it. Don't feed whatever it is that arises. Let it be by itself and relax. As soon as you relax, you're not attached to it anymore. You're seeing it the way it actually is. Then smile and Go back to doing what you were doing with a mind that is not clouded, that doesn't have a hindrance in it, that's not restless, that's not dulled out. The two biggest hindrances that you have is restlessness and sloth and torpor. Actually, it's not sloth so much as it is torpor. Torpor means dullness. And the way that you observe and use the six R's is the way that you let go of this burden, of this pain that we keep causing ourselves because we keep getting involved with all of these different things and taking them personally. No eye making, no mind making. That's what the impersonal nature is all about. It's seeing the true nature of everything that arises and letting it be. Friends, formerly when I lived the home life, I was ignorant. Then the Tathagata, or his disciple, taught me the Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, I acquired faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, I considered thus, household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It's not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning small or large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relations. I shaved off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Having gone forth and possessed the monk's training and way of life, I purified my doubt, my, my mind from all hindrances. Having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of mind that weaken wisdom, 
quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states I entered upon and abided in the first jhana. Now this goes through all the jhanas. What are jhanas? That's something that's very much misunderstood. Almost everybody, when you talk to them about jhana, they say it's some form of concentration. And that's not a good definition. The definition that I give you right now is the one that works best and easiest. Every jhana is a different level of your understanding of how this process works. It's a different understanding. Each jhana actually is a different kind of meditation because the results of each jhana is a little bit different. When you're in the first jhana, it's different than being in the second jhana. When you're in the second jhana, it's different than being in the third jhana. So there are different kinds of meditation, but it's still using the six arts. And that's how you start developing your wisdom you start seeing more and more clearly how mind works differently when you're in a different jhana. And it gets to be quite interesting. When my collected mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the destruction of the taints. <coughs> I directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew, as it actually is, these are the taints. This is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of habitual tendencies from the taint of ignorance. When it was liber liberated, there came the knowledge it is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, friends, that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, eye-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to conceit, have I, to conceit, have been eradicated in me. Saying good, the monks may be delighted and rejoice in the monk's words. Having done so, one should say to him, it is a, green, a, green, a gain for us, friends. It is a great gain for us that we see such a companion in this holy life as, vener as the venerable one. That's what the blessed one said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the blessed one's words. So this gives you an idea of the way you have to develop your own observations. A lot of people, they say, well, you have to have insight knowledges. And there's these 16 insight knowledges that you need to have. Well, that's not necessarily true. Insight knowledges is your seeing how you cause yourself suffering and learn how to let it go. That's insight knowledge. 
and there's not any set number of those. It's seeing how the links of dependent origination actually occur and understand deeply. That's insight knowledge, not uh, seeing fear or anxiety or uh, anicca dukkha, not uh, now you will get to see those as you go deeper into your jhana practice and you will see them personally. You'll see how everything actually does work. It's not an opinion. So you get to see that and understand it deeply. That's the kind of practice that we need to be doing. So, I've been talking for a while. Do you have any questions? Yes. Hello, Bhante. You have to Can turn on your uh, unmute. You have to. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Any, any question? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Vanta. Uh, I have a question about determination. Uh, how to make it properly? Should I always go through all Brahma Viharas or I can start when I want it? No, a determination just means that you're going to point your mind in a particular direction that you want it to go. You can make a determination that I'm going to sleep for 15 minutes and then wake up very alert. And then you try to do that. You follow that. A okay. determination can also be that you want to be in one particular jhana or the other. You can do that. It takes practice to be able to do that. Okay. But you, you will be able to, it's just pointing your mind in the direction you want it to go at that time. Okay, I, I, I am, I'm able to start whatever where I want uh, to start. If I want to start in compassion, it's not a problem. If I want to start the equanimity, it's, all, it's not a problem or even higher. Usually I meditate without uh, any technique, just close the eyes and go deeply into my mind. And um, I've read on the website that I should start the termination with uh, practicing all Brahma Viharas. So I should start with Metta, Peruna, and so on until neither perception nor perception, and then take determination to get into particular jhana and emerge when after some time. Okay. One of the things I want to caution you with with determinations is if you make a strong determination to get in a particular jhana and you don't hit it right away, then you're starting to put in too much energy and you start not being able to get into any jhana at that time. So a determination has to be a uh, gentler kind of suggestion for your mind. Okay. Um. Okay, so, so should I start from the metta, or yeah. I can, yeah, and go through all the stages, and then took one of the stages to go? Well, it, you when you make a determination, you just stay in that. Okay, because uh, I tried, uh, I have tried a few times, and I've noticed that, for example, if I go to joy, I think you, you're quite right, because I felt uh, like something like too much tension when I try to stay in a particular jhana. Right, you're pushing too hard. You're trying yeah. too hard. You have to back off. Okay. Now, I teach people how to get mastery of going in and out of the jhanas at any time. And that works a lot with determination. Uh, I generally don't teach people that unless they're successful with their meditation. Because okay. it is, it is a, a little more difficult. But it has to do with 
starting out and making a determination that you're going to be in this jhana for this length of time and then try to hit exactly going in and out of that jhana. Okay. I've, I've tried that kind of few times. A uh, few times I hit the time. It was a five, ten minutes. But few times I, I missed or for a few minutes. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes practice. Okay. And you, have to, you have to stay with the same jhana for the same length of time until you hit it exactly four or five times in a row. Okay. And then you change to another, another length of time. Okay, but my, you know, the, my main question is, should I uh, always go first through the all stages? Because I've read um, mm -hmm. instruction and there was, before you start determination, you should go through all the stages. Well, you go through all the stages as you learn the mastery of going in and out of jhana. Uh -huh. Then you can go to say you're walking down the street and you see a baby cry. You want to send some joy to them. You make a determination. I'm just going to go to this joy and send them some happiness for two or three minutes. And then you do that and you'll see the change that happens. Or you can go visit somebody that's depressed. And you say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay with compassion and radiate loving kindness to them the whole time I'm in the room. Okay. I, I know. And uh, I do practice like that. Okay. I try not always remember that, but when I'm in a situation that I'm angry, I'm in, I'm in some fight with something, for example, at work, I use this, this compassion, so I try to wait. I, I try to go into compassion mm. and radiate compassion towards them. I pr also practice um, joy and equanimity. For example, when I have lots of my mind is really busy and I have lots of stress at work, I try to get and walk with equanimity and speak with people with equanimity. Right. Now, when you have... Uh an excess of uh, restlessness, it's very helpful for you to make a determination to bring up the feeling of tranquility. Uh -huh. And radiate that to yourself, and that will help your mind settle down. I, I use this when I go in um, neither per neither perception nor perception when I really deep. Sometimes I have my mind starts in shaking because it's bored, and then I... Well, that means that this. mindfulness is not very sharp if it starts shaking. Yeah. The whole point of being in neither perception or non-perception is sitting with a quiet mind without any disturbance at all. Okay. So you're not in that jhana when you have that restlessness. Okay, but, well, you know... Uh, the mind is fluid when, you know, sometimes I'm, uh, the state can change, yeah? If they change, that means you're not in that jhana anymore. Okay, okay, so I, I would, okay, I understand. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I have a question. Yes. Earlier, you said that the reason that we're here is because we broke precepts in the past. Right. Does that mean that's the reason why we're born as human beings? Or we have craving and we have clinging. Yeah. And the reason we have craving and clinging is because in the past we broke precepts. And we have that guilty feeling. That's why the hindrances arise. Oh, okay. And that's, that's why when somebody becomes an arahat, they don't have any craving and clinging anymore. That yeah. means that they're not going to be reborn. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bhante, I, I have a question. Uh, thank, okay. you for your, thank you for your talk. Uh, 
just picking up a little bit on the question that the first person was asking. Yeah. So if someone, if, you know, if someone is in neither perception nor non-perception and their mind shifts, they're no longer in that jhana. Does You're that no mean, longer in the jhana when you right. have disturbance? Does that mean you like drop down to the jhana below? Or are you in no jhana at all? Or like what happens if you when you come out of that and if there's a disturbance? Does that mean you drop there's down? There's a disturbance. You're not in the jhana until you let go of that, and then you can go back into the jhana. Being in neither perception nor non-perception be, means being in the quiet mind without disturbance for long periods of time, half an hour, hour, two hours, three hours, like that. Right. So if you come out of that jhana, do you go down to um, nothingness? No. You're just out of all jhanas. You, you have a hindrance. You're in the hindrance. I see. This is why I tell people a lot of the time, I want you to sharpen your mindfulness so you can see the very, very beginning of any movement of mind's intention and relax. And stay with that quiet mind. That way you're not, you're not distracted for more than a second or two. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Bante. Hello. Um, I have two questions today. Okay. Uh, it's related to the quiet mind. Uh, that my question is like uh, sometimes uh, in my meditation, uh, a small disturbance starts, and I will apply six R, and I can see that after six R. Uh, the hindrance, the disturbance has went away and there is relief. I can note, I can feel that. And I'm continuing with my quiet mind. Uh, sometimes what happening is the next distraction is coming very early, like one to two minutes. Again, the same thing I will apply and I will continue with quiet mind. Well, that says that your mindfulness is not very sharp if it lasts for that long. I want you to sharpen your mindfulness so you can see the first little tiny movement and let it be and relax and stay with a quiet mind. That means that you have to take more interest in staying with the quiet mind. You have to sharpen your interest a little bit more. And when I say a little bit, I mean a little bit, just a tiny bit. And if that doesn't quite work as well as it could, then you add a little bit more. But just learn how to adjust the amount of energy you need so you can stay on your object of meditation without losing, uh, be, without being in the jhana. Okay. Stay with quiet mind as much as you can. Okay? Okay, Bande. Uh, another question. Uh, yeah. This is not related to meditation, but uh, like when I was practicing before with other technique, I at max I used to sit for one hour, but now I can able to sit for like one and a half hour, one hour forty five minutes, without any any pains. Why? What is the reason that uh, I can able to? people can sit comfortably such a long time. Well, you can sit comfortably longer because you're using a six hours now. <laughs> That's the real reason. But why is why the pains, nothing is coming? Well, because you're not letting go of the craving when you're using another meditation. And if you don't let go of the craving, you don't really recognize the hindrances when they start to come up and they can catch you and distract you very strongly. When you use the six R's, you are recognizing the hindrance when it comes up and you let it go more quickly, more easily, more naturally. That's why. Okay. 
and extend your sitting if you have the time. Extend your sitting so that you're sitting more than two hours. I'll try one day. <laughs> no, there is no try. There's only do. Okay, I'll do it then. <laughs> I need to wake up early then. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for answering my questions, Bante. I have okay. no more questions now. Uh, Bante, can you yeah. uh, talk about the uh, formations? Yeah. Um, I'm, what, what do you need to know about them? I, I'm familiar, I, I understand the other terms, but uh, about dependent origination, but formations, uh, I, I don't know that I have a good picture of what they are. Okay, when you're looking at the formations according to dependent origination, you're looking at the potential of the arising of body, speech, and mind. It's only the potential that you're seeing with formations. Just like consciousness, you're seeing the potential for consciousness to arise, but it has to have more than just uh, the consciousness itself. You have to have consciousness of something, of one of the sense doors. Okay. Okay, so I just, we're talking about potential. Okay? It, it, but it, it says it comes up first, so... Well, the potential is there for it to come up, but it needs to have other things arise so that it will come up. Okay. All right, let me think about that for a okay. while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi, Bante. Yes. Um, so I have a question. So for engineers and basically those working in the science that have got busy mind and they develop this problem solving mind. So sometimes the mind is busy and it takes time to quiet the mind before you do the meditation. Do you have any recommendation on how to quiet the mind before doing the meditation? Use the six hours. I mean, you develop this habit of problem solving with the work, right? I mean, you said that the disturbances okay. or hindrances is because you broke a precept before, but what if somebody's job is problem solving? I mean, mind oh, gets... Well, welcome to the engineering world. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your intuition. Ask yourself, what is the easiest way for me to have a quiet mind? Ask it just once the answer will come to you. Okay. But engineers, they're the hardest ones to teach because you've been taught all through college to think, 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 think. Yes. And now you come to this and you want to go, well, I don't want to think now but you have developed that habit. So it, it just takes a little bit more energy and effort to understand how to let it go. And you do need to ask your intuition. And your intuition will tell you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Also develop your sense of humor more. Thank Maybe you. laugh more. Okay? Hey. <laughs> okay? Anybody else? Then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May yeah. all shed all grief, and may all beings I work and well. may try. May all beings with this merit that we have thus acquired, acquisition of all kinds.
Okay. I hope to see you all next week. Thank right. you, Thank you, David. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Gon. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gon. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you. 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 Thank you.